Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this week's virtual plant clinic. My name is Bill Lester. I'm with University of Florida Extension Service here in Hernando County. And I guess technically today we begin our fourth year of offering almost every week virtual plant clinics. The idea behind this was if you think back a couple of years to the very beginning of COVID, when everybody was being sent home from their workplace, people were asked not to go out and about, we weren't able to have people come to our office and stop by and ask us questions. They could still call us on the phone and they could still email and they did, but we wanted to do something to kind of um, replicate what we were able to offer in person. And this was the closest that we could get at the time and seems to have done very, very well. Last week, we had our big three-year anniversary. So good morning, buddy. How are you? And everybody was here. And now this week, it's just me. Uh, Lily is up in Pennsylvania right now. My boss, Jim Davis, is doing something else. I'm not even sure what today. And all you guys get today is just me. So if you have any lawn and garden questions, please feel free to go ahead and put them in the comments. And we'll go ahead and comment on them and try to answer your question and start to formulate what your problem probably is and what the solutions are. Good morning, everybody. Everybody's kind of popping in here. Boy, how come every time I'm all by myself, I get record turnout? <laughs> and then other times, well, yeah, I'm going to have to point this out to Lily. When Lily's here, sometimes we only have a few people that log on at the very beginning. But when it's just me, I guess people know it and they come on in droves. So if anybody has any kind of lawn and garden question, please put them in the comments and we'll try to figure out what it is. We obviously get a lot of questions about lawns and gardens and strange insects that people see outside, inside, everything imaginable. And so often people will contact us and they want a solution, obviously, but they have no idea what the problem is. They don't even know for sure whether it's really a problem or not. They haven't really thought that part through, and, but they want a solution. And it's usually something that they can spray that's going to fix all their problems and their life is going to be wonderful. And a lot of times it doesn't work quite like that. So sometimes when somebody sends us a question, it's very easy for us to look at and tell them, it's a problem. It's not a problem. You should worry about it. You shouldn't worry about it. Other things we have to dig a little bit deeper. So let me go ahead and um, share a picture that was emailed to me just yesterday, I think. Let me go ahead and find it here. Yes, this picture came in from some people who live in a um, – uh, housing community here in Hernando County and they said we have these little insects on the wall of our house outside and they said somebody from the county the county came by and told them it was something that bred in bromeliads and they treated for it and but they still have the problem I'm a little confused about what the the back story is I'm going to have to email them when we're done here today and get some more information on what they're basing all this on, but apparently they have some kind of very small insects on the outside of their house, which is very common. And they actually got a pretty good up close picture of what they look like. And this is what they look like. These are midges. They are also called blind mosquitoes. They have uh, really, really reduced mouth parts. So they do not bite you. They do not poke you. They do not transmit diseases like actual mosquitoes can they're related to mosquitoes but they are not mosquitoes and they're not biting flies they are just an annoyance and they are outside and what they do is they live in um wet areas and they can breed in uh little puddles muddy water muddy areas so if you have an empty lot or some woods or a natural area within a mile or so of you, they're there. They're gonna breed, they're gonna reproduce, they're flying around, 
you turn on your porch lights at night and boom, they're out by your porch lights at night. They're attracted to lights at night. They don't harm anything. And there's really no chemical control available to spray for them. I mean, what are you going to spray? Is it really so important you have to spray the whole neighborhood with a helicopter or a plane? And then if you're dumping insecticides over such a wide area, you're going to disrupt so many other things and cause so many other problems that it's not a really good plan of attack. So I will have to email them back and try to find out who did you get your information from? Because apparently it was not turning into county mosquito control. It was from somebody else. And what did they do? And no, these guys do not breed in bromeliads. There is a species, a native species of Florida mosquito that does breed in bromeliads. So, you know, if you have bromeliads in your yard, it's shaped like kind of a, a saucer or a vase. And when you water or it rains, the water kind of pools up and puddles inside of there. There's a whole bunch of different insects that live in that water. I've actually gone and dumped the water out and looked for what's in there. There are predators in there. But unfortunately, there can be mosquitoes breeding in there also. That species of mosquito will bite the heck out of you, which is a bad thing. But they generally do not vector diseases. It's not a major vector of diseases. So if you have your entire backyard is filled with bromeliads, you're going to have a mosquito problem, potentially. If you start to have problems with mosquitoes, you can go out there with a garden hose, flush that water out, or you can get um, little mosquito bits. It's a little ground up, um, kind of like sand. And what it is, it's granules of BT, a specific type of BT that kills mosquitoes. And you can sprinkle some of that out there. They make that BT in dunks also. So for anybody who might have um, livestock out in the countryside and you have the really big water troughs and the water troughs get filled with mosquitoes, you can throw a dunk in there and it will kill the mosquitoes. So for this problem, as a general rule, people who have large numbers of midges are probably going to have to pretty much live with it. Because if you go out there and spray them, you'll kill the adults. Adults are only around for a day or two, maybe three. And then the next batch is going to come along the next night and you spray and the next batch comes along. You're not getting to the heart of the problem and you're not going back to the immature stage to actually control them. And you're just throwing, throwing spaghetti against the wall ultimately. So for this problem, there really isn't a good uh, chemical control for that. So we have a couple comments here. Maggie Chilivini says, lucky Lily, I miss Pennsylvania. I want to plant native plants for wild tortoises. We had one and I was delighted, but FF and W, probably FWC took it away. Yes, gopher tortoises are endangered animals and they are protected by the state. And they're federally protected also. Many people, especially if you live out in the country in a very sandy area, may have gopher tortoises living on your property. You're not allowed to molest them or move them or ride them or do any other wacky things, shoot strange videos and put them on TikTok. You cannot do that. And if you do put videos on TikTok with that, somebody may notice it and you may get in some serious trouble for that. Go for tortoises. Um, I'll have to look that up. Be sure to tune in next week. And I know that there is a list somewhere of different things that go for tortoises eat. And of course, they are all native plants. And if you plant them, they will feed, you know, you'll be providing food naturally for. Um, Gopher tortoises. You don't want to be giving gopher tortoises lettuce or I don't know what else you might give them, leftover dinner or anything like that. You don't want to be out there feeding the gopher tortoises because technically you're not allowed to do that also. But there is information online. I'm not sure if Teresa is on right now and she wants to try looking that up. Um, 
Mike Singer, who used to be the coordinator of Hernando County's environmentally sensitive lands, and he had to deal with gopher tortoises a lot also, shared with me the um, plant guide, and boom, here we go. See, you ask, and Teresa finds it and pops it right up. So, so Maggie, you may not want to try writing this whole thing down. I don't know if you write very, very quickly. You probably can't. I'll leave it up there for a moment or two. But if you look, um, if you go to the um, FWC, the Florida Wildlife Commission, and you look under uh, gopher tortoises, they have a lot of information there. So different plants that you could try growing on your property that are really going to benefit gopher tortoises. These are generally all native plants because native tortoises eat fruit off of native plants. Kind of makes sense. And that's a really, really good resource. Uh, Corey has a big bull gopher tortoise. I have several in my neighborhood, and they live in empty lots, which we have fewer and fewer of. But there's some areas between houses that were never developed, and the gopher tortoises still live back there. But I have one on a regular basis. He'll just come out, go through the neighbor's yard, go across the street, stroll through my yard, stop, eat a weed, eat another weed, and keep on going. I'm not sure where he's going or what he's doing. But I know one day, may even still have a video of that. He came in, and I had a great big weed growing in my yard. I have a freedom lawn. I don't treat for weeds. I, I just let them be. And he really, really liked the look of this weed. He stopped and he ripped it out of the ground and gobbled up the whole thing. So they are really neat animals. Unfortunately, they're fewer and fewer. When we have growth and development, more of them get hit by vehicles. They have less property to build their um, homes in and reproduce in. So it's um no maggie generally go for tortoises don't pollinate anything they are um something called a keystone species so they do dig holes in the ground that they make their burrow in and there are a huge number of other insects animals everything that makes use of those holes to live in so if we lose gopher tortoises, we potentially lose a lot of other species also. Everything out there in nature kind of ties together and depends on each other. Um, Monique says, I have yellow spotting on my baby cucumber leaves. Does it need magnesium? It will probably, cucumbers are fairly heavy feeders, so it would benefit from a well-rounded, balanced um, fertilizer. Unfortunately, cucumbers and everything else in that family get a lot of diseases. They can get bacterial diseases, but they very frequently get fungal diseases. So if you're growing cucumbers, you're going to have to look into purchasing a fungicide and spraying with it on a regular basis. So Monique, you're going to have to do a little um, studying up on fungicides because if you try growing cucumbers, and you figure, I just don't want to spray anything. I'm just going to plant this cucumber seeds. It's going to grow, and I'm going to get cucumbers. They generally do very, very well and don't have many diseases right now because it is sunny and warm and not very humid outside, and it has not been raining. When it becomes more humid, and especially when it starts to rain, your cucumbers will get lots of diseases. You're going to have to spray on a regular basis with the fungicide for that. Copper fungicide works just fine. Uh, Monique makes a very important comment here about mosquito control will come and spray your yard. All you have to do is call them. You are partly correct. If you call mosquito control, they will come and they will walk through your yard and they'll look at your neighbor's yard and they will tell you all the different ways you can reduce the number of mosquitoes that you have in your yard. If you have buckets of water, if you have puddles of water, if you have old tires in your backyard, not that you do, but some people do, or maybe the neighbor has junk in their backyard that's collecting water, and now you have a mosquito problem. They will try everything they can do 
to reduce the number of mosquitoes that way because spraying, good old fashioned spraying, the truck that drives down your street is the least effective way to control mosquitoes. A lot of our body mosquitoes are out during the day and the trucks are out at night. So obviously that doesn't work. Um, the trucks turn the insecticide into an aerosol. That aerosol has to, a drop of it actually has to hit the mosquito. Very, very hard to do. So they're not, they don't rush out there and start spraying with the truck. If you have standing water nearby, say at the end of your street, you have a retention pond or not retention pond, a drainage ditch. Um, I know that there's lots of ditches for moving and clearing water in Brooksville. They'll come out and there's different things that they can spray on it that are very, very safe and effective, but they really are hesitant to come out there and spray like they used to. They still will if they have to, but they're not going to kind of a drop of a hat. Very expensive now also. Everything has gotten more expensive, pesticides included. So yes, Maggie, if you look up online under FWC, go for tortoises, they have a lot of really good information there. And if you look up University of Florida, go for tortoises, they have a lot of good information too, if you have them either on your property or in your neighborhood. And Bill asks, what's your opinion on aeration of St. Augustine grass? My neighbor is renting one for her yard and offered its use to me if I wanted, concern with stressing the grass out during this dry time. I know of very, very, very few people who aerate their St. Augustine grass. Almost all of us here in Central Florida have very, very sandy soils, which do not become compacted unless you drive on them, you're parking trailers on them, there's a lot of heavy traffic on top of it. If your yard becomes compacted because of that, you may have to aerate it. Um, you may have to aerate it if the thatch piles up and thatch is caused by too much water and too much fertilizer. So if you back off on the water, the fertilizer and put appropriate amounts on, not just tons, because you're thinking more is better because it isn't necessarily. And you cut your grass frequently, so you're only cutting off a little bit of grass, not three inches of grass every time you cut it, because you let it get you know knee high before you cut it. That helps to reduce thatch. Um, aerating it is extremely stressful on the grass. You are taking basically knives and poking it into your lawn. It makes a huge mess. You end up with tons of dead runners, live runners, chunks of soil, you have to rake it afterwards. It's a very, very messy operation. It is very, very damaging to your grass and it's used as kind of a last resort if your problem really is something that can be solved by aeration. Like I said, it's very, very rare that anybody has that problem that it needs to be aerated. And it's usually because of something that the homeowner did not just because every 10 years you have to aerate it or I naturally have too much thatch because if you're managing your lawn correctly, you won't have a thatch problem. Those little grass clippings break down and disappear very quickly. It's when you add too much fertilizer, too much water, uh, the runners are growing too aggressively because of that. You let your grass get knee high, and cut off so much that you have piles of grass out there. Those are all things that kind of contribute to problems that you may have to aerate. So I'd be interested to hear how your neighbor's lawn turns out after doing that and whether or not your neighbor's yard really needs it, or maybe her brother-in-law said she needs it or another neighbor said, ah, you need to aerate your lawn. Cause you know, we did that every year up in New Hampshire. Well, this is Florida. This isn't New Hampshire. Lee, good morning. How are you? Teresa has a link to um, mosquito control. And this is University of Florida information on mosquito control. Every county in Florida has a mosquito control department. That is by law 
because it is a component of public safety because mosquitoes can transmit diseases. And years ago in Florida, if you go back far enough, we have problems with yellow fever. We have problems with um, a whole host of different diseases that were spread by mosquitoes. So getting mosquitoes under control a hundred years or so ago was extremely important for people to even be able to live here in Florida without promptly getting all kinds of terrible fatal diseases and dying. So by law, every county has a mosquito control department. So whatever county you live in, feel free to look yours up online. I guarantee you they have a lot of good information. Many of them are probably very active on social media. I know Hernando County's is. So, and I know the person who runs Hernando County Mosquito Control's Facebook page. Her name is Alyssa. Very nice. Very helpful. We need to have her on as a guest here really soon. So be sure to go on Facebook, look up Hernando County Mosquito Control, and like them and follow them. And tell Alyssa that I said hi. Oh, and Monique says, it's not... It's a couple guys who come and spray. They will actually put a larvicide in your bromeliads and elsewhere. That is the BT that I was talking about. And they have a couple of other um, controls, things that are very, very safe to use. They're very effective. It doesn't kill everything. It only is targeting mosquitoes. It's not going to kill your neighbors and your dog and your neighbor's dog and everything else. So it's, they have a lot of very, very safe things that they can use. And if you complain and contact them, they will come out and they'll try to figure out what the problem is. And if they need to spray in a drainage ditch or you have a lot of bromeliads or um, uh, muddy areas where mosquitoes are breeding, they'll find it, they'll identify it, and they'll take steps to help control it. They're very, very helpful people, but they are really hesitant to do the old fashioned, send the truck out at night and blow the fog out. Because everybody seems to think that, that if they do that, all the mosquitoes are gonna go away. That's just not true. The truck sometimes is necessary, but it's not the most effective way to control mosquitoes. They will come out and they use integrated mosquito management. And they look at what are all the different ways that we can avoid mosquitoes, all the different little things we could do to control them. And the truck is just one little piece of the whole puzzle. It's not the be all and end all. So don't go calling mosquito control saying, send the truck over tonight because they'll help you, but you probably won't see the truck that night. So Maggie, you are very welcome. Teresa's is just, go she's going link crazy today. She has things up about your Florida lawn and <clears throat> helping to improve compacted soils. It's funny because, you know, in other states, you have problems with compacted soils. And if you're trying to grow a lawn, you may have to aerate, you may have to do something, depending on what kind of grass you're growing. You know, Kentucky bluegrass and all the different fescues and rye grasses they make up northern lawns. They are not your year-round lawn here. Some of them you can plant in the winter and they're going to grow over the winter and then die right about now. It's usually early to mid-April when they die and just kind of melt away because it gets too hot here. So here in Central Florida in Hernando County, we see almost everybody has either a Bahia lawn or St. Augustine lawn. A few people have Bermuda grass, and there are improved varieties of Bermuda, but we don't see that very often. Homeowners don't really like Bermuda that much because when you cut it, for a couple of days at least, it turns brown across the top. So a lot of people don't like that. They don't think it's very attractive. And we have zoysia grass. We have very little zoysia here in Hernando County. If you're familiar with the villages over in Sumter and Lake and Marion and basically gobbling up the whole area over there, they put a lot of zoysia in over there. Zoysia is complicated. You have to read up on it and you have to manage it perfectly. It is very unforgiving. If you do not manage it correctly, 
it will get angry and it will go dormant and turn totally brown. And it's really hard to get it to change its mind and green up again. If you have a zoysia lawn and everything looks perfect, it is a beautiful lawn. It's very, very soft. You keep it short. And you can roll around in it, and your dog's going to love it. And the kids love it. But, boy, it's really, really hard to manage. So if you live in Hernando County, please don't get Zoysia. If you do, read and study University of Florida materials on how to manage it correctly. I was about to say, don't call me. You can call me if you have to. But you're going to have to read and study first and learn a lot. There's not a whole lot I can do to help you is what I'm getting at with Zoysia. It is finicky. So Teresa is putting up more information on Hernando County's mosquito control. They have a lot of very, very good information. Like I said, they do have a, uh, if you have a problem, you can go to their website and they have a contact us page. And you put in who you are what your problem is, and you put in where you are on a map, your location, and they'll contact you, and they'll come right out, and they'll figure out what your mosquito problem is, or midge problem, or other insect problem. They can, they only control mosquitoes. So, for example, for midges, nothing they could do, nothing they could spray. We have nothing to recommend to spray. There's nothing that's going to control midges without just going nuclear and killing everything else in your yard. Unfortunately, a lot of people do that. We try to recommend against it because long-term, you cause more problems than you solve. And Teresa has a good point here that frogs live in her bromeliads. I think they're eating the mosquito larva. A lot of things eat mosquito larva. It's just that mosquitoes lay a lot of eggs, and if you have places for them to lay eggs, you're going to have a lot of larvae. So everything from tadpoles, frogs, toads, dragonflies eat mosquitoes. The flying ones, dragonfly larvae live in the water, and they gobble up mosquito larvae. There are um, fly larvae that live in the water and eat mosquito larvae. So mosquito larvae are one of those bottom of the food chain kind of organisms that's eaten by a lot of other things, but still obviously they don't eat them all because we still have mosquitoes. So mosquitoes in one sense are very important organisms because they feed a lot of other things, but in another sense, they are an important pest because they can potentially cause human health issues. So kind of a gray area. If you have a problem with mosquitoes, you want to get good information and control just the excess mosquitoes that are bothering you without going nuclear and trying to um, kill every living thing on your property because you can't sanitize the great outdoors. You can't go out there and I don't like mosquitoes, and I don't like lover grasshoppers, and there's a few other things I don't like. I need all them gone, but I like birds. I like hawks. I like butterflies. They all are interdependent on each other. And if you're not careful, if you kill all the caterpillars, you won't have any birds. Why would a bird want to live in your yard? you got nothing for them to eat. So you're going to have to think about this, write out a list, and don't try to sanitize the great outdoors. Unfortunately, some things we just have to live with. The midges, I get midges too a couple times during the summer. I get a lot of them, the lights um, on the front of our garage that shine on the driveway. We just have an outbreak of them. I don't know where they come from. And I got billions of them. I'm just careful not to keep the door open, try to keep them out of the house. Other than that, little tiny flying things in the summer, if one's in your house, use these two things. Go around them. Just try to swat them like that. Don't flip out over these things. Don't don't go and spray your entire house because you have one fly. You know, show a little common sense and get a little exercise and go out there and take care of them manually that way. Maggie loves the sound of the frogs. Um, frogs and crickets and all those different nighttime things that live outside. 
I used to live in Deltona over in Volusia County, and I always had a large um, garden pond out in the front of the house, right outside the front door with a fountain. It was beautiful. And oh my gosh, during the summer, the toads loved it. I would have millions of them. And when it rained in the evening, right after the rain, you could step out front and they were deafening. But it was such a such a relaxing sound. And my wife would go out there and she loved like, because they all sing in unison. So she'd go, Rah! and then all of them all at once would respond, Rah! like a hundred of them. And she'd get a kick out of just kind of talking back and forth with them. So, so enjoy some of this. Believe it or not, we get phone calls from people about how do I get rid of lizards? I ask them, why would you want to? Because they get mile and eye. <laughs> Live with them. They're not going to hurt anything. If you have a cat or dog that tries to eat them, discourage them from doing that. You can take a cup, and I don't have an empty one here. Take a plastic cup and take a piece of cardboard or stiff paper and try to get the cup over them. Slide the paper underneath it. Take the whole thing outside and let them free again. So there are ways of dealing with these problems. So Basem, good morning, how are you? What benefits for the lawn when we add compost over it? And if so, how often? Turf grass loves compost, especially if you're the area where you live and the soil in your yard is very, 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 very sandy with very low organic matter. Sand does not hold the water very well. It doesn't hold fertilizer ions or nutrients very well. And they tend to be lost very quickly if all you have is sand out there. If you start spread, just lightly spreading compost over it, you know, you can do it as often as you want. I wouldn't do it every day. I wouldn't do it every week. You could do it every month. You could do it every couple of months or definitely a few times a year. And there are <coughs> commercial services that are starting to offer this. They have a piece of equipment. It's a large gas-powered spreader. So they go through your yard and they blow the compost all over. It helps to build up the soil underneath where your grass is growing, where the roots are. It holds water in longer so your lawn doesn't dry out as quickly when things are dry and it's not raining a lot helps to hold the nutrients. So if and when you do fertilize your lawn, the nutrients are held in the root zone there for much longer. Researchers at UF are working on this right now. And we even have um, a recorded class on that. If you ever go to our um, YouTube channel, let me go ahead and pull that up. And you're probably not going to, hmm, where did that go? Here we go. So if you go to our Hernando County Government YouTube, so if you go to YouTube, search for Hernando County Government, if you look under Florida Friendly Landscape, you're going to find Lily's over 105 recorded classes. If you look under uh, Hernando County Extension, you're going to find mine. And we have one on lawns and how to build up the soil for your lawns. And compost is one of the most beneficial things that you can add to your lawn on a regular basis. You know, compost is not a fertilizer. So it is exempt from fertilizer ordinances. So even if it's a blackout period in the county that you live in, and double check this because every county is different. But as a general rule, you can add compost, and that's fine. You're not going to get in trouble. So compost is great for lawns. It is the best thing you can do for a lawn. And Jenny has a Floritam lawn. Floritam is a variety of St. Augustine. St. Augustine is a type of grass. So you have Floritam, you have Bitter Blue, you have Raleigh. You have about a half a dozen other varieties, but 99% or more of St. Augustine lawns are good old-fashioned Floritan. So that's what 
Jenny was told about 25 years ago. Is there another name for it? I rarely hear you talk about it. It isn't doing well. When we say St. Augustine, that covers Floritam and, like I said, probably about 10 other varieties. Floritam is a variety that does well in full sun, grows fairly quickly. It's a full size variety. There are a couple of dwarf varieties of St. Augustine now. Almost nobody gets the other varieties put in. You have to look long and hard for a um, SOG company or service that actually can get them and put it in. People with, with very shady yards will put in Bitter Blue, St. Augustine. It takes shade better, but it's not going to grow in like full darkness underneath really heavy oak trees. So when I say St. Augustine, I mean Floritam. They are used in my head interchangeably. So if your floor tam lawn is not doing well, could be a lot of different reasons. That narrows it down to about 50 different possibilities. One thing you must do, and don't ask me any further questions until you do this, your grass must be cut about four inches high. Don't tell me that you already do it because my I can almost guarantee that you probably don't do it. Let me see if I have a ruler in my drawer here. No, I don't have one handy. No, I got everything else except for a ruler. And I don't have my yardstick here with me. I have a yardstick and I'm marked in red tape from zero to four. And I can walk in somebody's yard, place it down. If I can see that red tape, you're not cutting your lawn four inches high. You need to cut it. <laughs> Look at this. Asking you shall receive. We even, if anybody wants to stop by our office, we'll give you a ruler. And this is a way that you can measure how tall your grass is. We start at zero and we go up to one, two, three, and four. And Lily got these made because it says, does your lawn measure up? Mow at three and a half to four inches. St. Augustine is best at four inches. That's right here. And it's even marked. So if you put this in your grass and the grass comes up to maybe here, that's two and a half inches. That'll kill your lawn long term. When I get questions, if I have to go look at somebody's lawn, if people send me pictures, if they bring in samples to the office, this is the first thing we look at. If you're cutting it two inches tall, two and a half inches tall. Last week I showed that picture. I'll even show it again because I think that I didn't delete it. It's still here. Here we go. Here's a picture of somebody's lawn. And it's a little hard to tell from this picture, but he cuts it at about a half an inch high. And he has St. Augustine grass. Well, he had St. Augustine grass. It is now dead and gone. He's got a couple runners left over that just haven't quite given up the ghost and died and disappeared yet. And he just fertilized it. And he watered it. And he's asking, why is my neighbor taking pictures of me watering my lawn? Why can't I water my grass whenever I want? Because I put down fertilizer and I don't want to burn the grass. Number one, you don't have to worry. You have no grass to burn. Number two, fertilizer is probably not going to burn the weeds. That's about all you have going on. And not even many of them, really. Uh, number three, why would you waste water on that lawn? Number four, if you want a nice St. Augustine lawn, you're going to have to resod. When you get down to like less than 10% turf grass, it's time to resod. Because there's no way you're going to get, a, if you really, really want pure St. Augustine or close to it, you're always going to be fighting the weeds. So we'll show this again one more time. There's all kinds of bare dirt and dead weeds. Now, look across the street. And it might be a little hard to see, but you see somebody with a yard that's extremely green. I was able to take this picture and I could blow it up on my computer. And they have St. Augustine lawn. It looks like they're cutting it at a pretty decent height. 
except this gentleman in his email pointed out that his neighbor waters twice a day. Let me let that sink in for a moment. They water twice a day. They have a beautiful lawn. They water twice a day. We can't afford to have people to water twice a day. It's against our watering restrictions to water twice a day. When they get a $100 ticket, they're going to think twice about watering twice a day. So they're probably not going to do that. But in their defense, it does look like they are cutting their grass higher. So, Jenny, you got to cut that grass really high. I would recommend four inches high for St. Augustine because otherwise you're always stressing out your grass. You're encouraging weeds. You will encourage chinch bugs when it gets really hot during the summer. And if you have take all root rot, cutting it short is a surefire way to have it just go crazy in your yard and kill your entire lawn. So start with cutting it high. And Maggie says she grows butterfly plants and brings them in on the porch to raise. I pick the caterpillars off the plants in the yard, in the garden and raise them on the screen porch and release them. That's great. If you can leave the caterpillars be, whether they be monarch caterpillars and you're trying to grow them on purpose, whether it's oleander caterpillars and they're eating up your oleander, whether it's a caterpillar on some other kind of ornamental plant out there, if you only have a few and you can leave them be, you know, everybody likes to eat a caterpillar. Birds eat them. Lizards eat them. Other insects eat them. Wasps eat them. Everybody wants to eat a caterpillar. So if you leave the caterpillars and you have an otherwise healthy, well-balanced ecosystem, either in your yard, your property, however much you own and control, you're probably, the caterpillars are going to disappear because somebody's going to eat them. Everybody likes to eat them. And Bill says he loves the lizards. I love them too. They are your first line of defense right outside of your house for eating roaches, beetles, bugs, anything that might want to sneak into your house. Those little lizards, all they do all day long is they make babies and they eat bugs. And that's it. That's pretty much all they do. So, um, Basem, you are very, very welcome. Spread compost on your St. Augustine lawn. If you do it a few times, you will notice a difference. You'll actually go, my lawn looks thicker and it looks healthier and it looks greener. You will get um, visible results from it. So, yeah, Jenny, I mean, there's a lot of things that could be specifically wrong with your St. Augustine slash Floritan, but you have to start with cutting it high. If you don't cut it high, all the other solutions are not going to be very, very helpful. Here's a tough one. Basem says, I have a grapevine that was given to me by a friend. He doesn't know what variety. How do I identify it? You have to grow it, have a flower, get the grapes, and then generally from looking at the grapes, you can tell what variety it is. So if your grapevine does well, hopefully it's some, some type of muscadine grape. Uh, when you get grapes on it, you can tell generally from the size and from the color which variety is so really can't say yet teresa has a nice link for saint augustine lawns there that tells you all the basics that you need to know okay Anne marie has a lengthy question here here let me get up above the question and still on the camera so Anne marie did crop rotation with her sweet potatoes but in last year's bed, I have sweet potato plants coming up. I pulled them and transferred to another bed. Is it okay to plant veggies in the raised bed from last year of the shoots keep coming up? Well, I, I can I can kind of give you some insight at this point. Sweet potatoes are great to grow. They do have a few pests, but not many. You want to rotate where you grow them, so you ideally don't want to grow 
in the same bed year after year after year after year, you're going to start to really intensify what problems you do have, whether it be nematodes, beetles, whatever it might be. So um, sweet potatoes, even after you dig them up in the fall and harvest the sweet potatoes, if you leave any little bit of the vine behind, it's going to sit there quietly over the winter and in spring come back. So sweet potatoes, if you plant them, they kind they you're going to have them forever in the same spot. It's perfectly fine to keep digging them up, move them to the other bed where you want to grow them this year. You can keep doing that. If some of them come up and you don't get a chance to dig them up, you can leave them too. It doesn't really hurt anything. Um, so should I just keep pulling the new growth from last year's sweet potatoes? Yeah, you could do that. Or dig them up and use them as this year's plants in the bed where you want to grow them. Last year, I grew sweet potatoes. I went to the store and bought four sweet four sweet potatoes from the produce department. I think at the Winn Dixie up the street. Took them home, put each one in a pot, a three gallon pot, and buried them halfway deep. I laid them long ways, half under the dirt, a bit above the dirt. And he started sending up shoots. Every shoot, once it gets to a decent size, take clippers and cut it right where it connects to the sweet potato, stick it in a pot full of soil. Literally 100% of them will root. At, and it only takes a week or so. After they root, you can gently loosen them up, pull them up. You have a sweet potato shoot with roots. Put it in the garden where you want to grow them. I still have those potatoes from last year. This winter, every time it got down to freezing, I brought them inside. They look really, really rough. They're sending off shoots. So I need to clean them up, start taking shoots, put them in pots. I can make, and you can make, literally as many sweet potato shoots and slips as you want to. I could, if I really want to be diligent, fill up enough pots with soil, I can make 100. I can make 1,000 of them. I'm going to plant a bunch of sweet potatoes this summer. It, you can do it now, but it's you still have plenty of time. We're not. We're just getting into sweet potato time right now. You can start a million little shoots of your own and plant sweet potatoes. Um. So going back to Anne Marie, I know you grow them. Why I am asking? I'm getting more slips of my own ready to go in as well. That's great. Really easy to do. And if you're trying to grow a garden and grow some food for the family, certain things like sweet potatoes are really good to grow because you'll almost always get sweet potatoes. Other things, if you're trying cucumbers, you may not get cucumbers if you have a bad disease problem. Yellow squash and zucchini, you may not get them. Uh, heirloom tomatoes that take a really long time to grow. You may not get any, or you may only get one or two, and you're like, well, that didn't work out really well. Sweet potatoes, if you grow a bunch of them, you will get a bunch of them for food. Hopefully, everybody here likes sweet potatoes. I love them. A lot of different things you can do with them. If you're fussy, yeah, you can throw all the marshmallows on them and everything else. That's, that's okay. Sweet potato fries, um, lots of different ways to cook them. So sweet potatoes are a definite winner. And Monique says, I put a little fertilizer in my compost, and those sections of lawn are beautiful uh, and very green. Yeah, compost they are finding more and more through research about um, the benefits of it. And Bill asks, what is the rate per 1,000 square feet for spreading compost? I don't know. Off the top of my head. Teresa, if she's still on, may want to look that up. Um, really, any you don't want to bury your lawn with compost. But even if you put on a tiny bit, it's good. If you put on a little bit more, it's good. If you put out a light sprinkling in, I tried doing this before with a conventional homeowner spreader, and it's really difficult because... The compost has to be very, very fine and very, very dry 
to shoot out of the spreader correctly. It kept getting clogged up. But that's okay because you could take a bag of compost or black cow, just grab a handful and throw it. Move a little bit and throw it slightly different direction. Throw it all over your lawn. It's all good. It's all going to benefit it. There is no special amount that you have to apply to get a benefit. Even a little bit, you're going to see a benefit. More is generally better. But you don't want to bury your grass, obviously, four inches deep. That's going to damage your grass, burying it. A light scattering. Because what happens is when it rains or you water, the compost dissolves and it goes down and it ends up in the root zone around the grass. The grass will grow up through it. The compost goes down and becomes one with the soil. And over time, you're building up the very, very top layer of soil in your yard. And that's where a lot of the grass's roots are. And where the grass is growing is really only in the top four to six inches anyway. So adding it, what helps is adding it on a regular basis, but lightly. So hopefully that helped a little bit. Um, Teresa has something on wasps. People either love them or they hate them. <laughs> um, and Amory, yeah, that's what she did with her sweet potatoes. I need to probably this weekend go ahead and clean mine up and start starting shoots for myself. The problem is where the sweet potatoes are going to go is where tomatoes are right now. So I'm in no big rush, but I need to start thinking about starting my own little shoots. And I tell you what, I want to be able to plant a bunch. Hopefully this fall, I'll have pictures and video to give you an idea of how much that you can get out of them. And you'll be so you'll get really, really, really big sweet potatoes. You get really small ones, in between ones. They're all good. And Teresa has a link to uh, sweet potatoes. If you go to our YouTube channel, if you go to YouTube. Go to Hernando County Government, look under the playlists, and find the Hernando County Extension playlist. I have a recorded class in there from, I think, like two years ago at this point, with the University of Florida researcher who, who works with growers over on the east coast of Florida, around St. Augustine, that area. And she does sweet potato research. And she tells you everything you need to know about planting them, caring for them, when to plant them, how long they take, how much to water them. The nice thing is they grow in the heat of summer, and they don't mind the heat. They say summer in Florida is just great with us. And if we're getting regular rains, you don't even have to water them. If it gets really, really dry, you might have to a few times. But most of the times, you don't have to even water your sweet potatoes because they're growing during rainy season. And like I said, even Amory says last year's sweet potatoes came out amazing. Mine came out really good. I just didn't plant enough. But I'm going to take care of that this year. And Bill, like I said, um, I will try to find out if there is a recommended amount per thousand square feet, either per application or per year. But going out there, doing it lightly and doing it frequently there's nothing wrong with that there's no downside to it other than you know a cost involved you know you're going to have to purchase or make or somehow obtain the compost to use but there's no downside to applying it lightly especially to a saint augustine lawn and it looks like teresa did find a um a blog post on that from lake county please be sure to go and read that that should be jamie lynn who wrote that very, very, very smart agent over there in Lake County. And I need to look that up and read that too. Uh, Teresa, why don't we share that on our Facebook page for everybody when you get a chance? That's probably very good reading. And Top Dressing Turf is, I can't stress just how good it is. It's very, very good for your lawn. So... Teresa is going to be difficult here and say, what is top dressing? Oh, top, she answers that question. Top dressing is the process of spreading a thin layer, about a quarter inch thick, 
of organic material on top of your lawn to amend your soil. You can top dress your entire yard or focus on bare spots and combine it with overseeding to fill them in. They are doing a lot of research on top dressing entire yards. This is important if you live in a fairly new home, let's say it was built 20 years ago or less, that's still considered a new home as far as the soil in your yard goes. New homes, they bring in a lot of um, topsoil and fill dirt, and you don't know where that fill dirt came from. There's usually no organic matter in it. It's just sand. Might be sky high in phosphorus, might not have any, might have really high pH, might have really low pH. I look at soil test reports that people get done here, and the most bizarre numbers, the ones that made me go like, oh, I wonder if they got the test right on this one. Their soil has 0.0% phosphorus in it. How can that be? That usually comes from new home construction. Eventually, your yard, you will form new soil in it. It kind of layers itself out. You do get organic matter at the surface. You can help that along by adding compost. And that will make your turf grass grow better and be healthier and require less water. That's a good thing. Require less fertilizer. That's a good thing. And require fewer trips to your extension office or phone calls to Bill. So, so if you do ever have further questions, the best way to get in contact with me is shoot me an email. There is my email address. If you have any really, really difficult, complicated questions, we ask that you send all those to Lily Browning, your Florida Friendly Landscape Coordinator here in Hernando County. So send her the confusing ones, the vague ones, the ones with the upside down pictures, send them all to her and she will help you to figure out what the problem is. Unfortunately, if she doesn't know what the answer is, she just forwards it to me. So I, I end up with all of them in the end anyway. Follow us on Facebook. Uh, for any of you who are not watching us on our regular Facebook page, you can. The Virtual Plant Clinic goes out live every week on our Facebook page, our private Facebook group, and also my YouTube channel. So if you're watching us on YouTube, be sure to follow us on uh, Facebook also. Easy to find if you just search for Hernando EXT. That is our official short name. You'll find us, like us, follow us. Um, every time we have something coming up, we put a post on there about it. And if you're interested in any of our classes, activities, if you go to the website, the web page is scrolling at the very bottom right there. www.hernandoextension, all one word, dot com. That is a full listing of all of my classes, all of Lily's classes, and any other classes that are being offered by our office. And all the details. Because we do things on Facebook, we do things on Zoom, we do things on YouTube, I do things on StreamYard, which is the platform that you're watching me on right now. We do things in person. We have a very interesting, for anybody in Hernando County or anywhere near Hernando County, we have an in-person class coming up in a few weeks on wells and septic systems. And as a part of that free class, we will send you a bottle in advance. If you fill that with tap water or well water, whatever, generally well water for somebody attending this class and bring it in, we will test it for you for free. So how do you find out about that? Go to HernandoExtension.com, scrolling across the bottom there. And Something else that I haven't shared for a while, you know, we have a very, very short Qualtrics survey where we ask people who watch the virtual plan clinic all the different things that we talk about and the questions we answer 
and things that I talk about and Lily talks about and we all share. Let me try to find um, the link to this so I can go ahead and share it in the comments. Um, we try to find out, did it really kind of help you out? Was it of any benefits to you? Uh, let me keep searching here for the link. Here we go. I'll go ahead and put a link to our survey in the comments here in just a moment. But we'd like to find out. Um, I'll go ahead and put the link to the um, YouTube channel. Also, I have that handy here. We want to know. Are we doing any any? Are we accomplishing any good here? Uh, is our advice at all helpful? I know it's terribly interesting, and on a good day, even entertaining. There we go. But we want to find out: Did you learn anything? Did you implement any Florida-friendly landscape concepts or ideas? Uh, do you watch us live or recorded or both? We found the vast majority of people watch both live and recorded, which is great. So obviously doing things this way um, it is a really big benefit to people who are able to watch us live. That's great. But for other people who aren't available to watch us live, they are watching the recording. So that's really, really great. Um, so please take a moment to take our short survey. If you've already taken it once in the past, don't take it again. We only need you to take the survey once. So don't think that you have to do it weekly because then that starts really confusing the uh, results there. So let me try turning off my phone here. So hey guys, if you have any last minute questions here, throw them in the chat because I think we're going to wrap it up in about one or two minutes. Um, other than that, I'd like to wish everybody a very, very happy Easter. Hopefully everybody has fun things planned for this weekend, and you have fun activities. Hopefully that involves some gardening, fresh air, sunshine. I know I'm going to, I'm behind on my vegetable garden. I'm going to be out there getting a few things done. I have tomato plants that desperately need to be tied up and fertilized. I'm going to get everything watered correctly because it's been really dry, no rain in my neighborhood. And I'm looking forward to the beautiful weather, even though it's starting to get a little warm. That's okay. I don't mind warm. I like warm. So um, hopefully everybody will have a great weekend. I don't think Lily is going to be back with us next week. I think she'll be back in town. But she won't be here. I think she has something else she has to do. So I'm going to try to find um, a guest guest person to come in with us. Amory, you have a happy Easter also. we got the little emojis flying around here. So everybody have a great weekend and a great Easter. And spend some, time, spend some time with your garden. Oh, my gosh. And let me spend some time silencing my stupid phone here. But I will be back here again next Thursday at 10 a.m. So if you have any lawn and garden questions, comments, pictures, anything else, send them, get them ready, share them, and we'll share them, and we'll all figure out uh, what the heck is going on together and come up with solutions for all your lawn and garden problems. So with that, uh, Teresa, thank you so much for um, helping in the background and being so incredibly quick with uh, pulling up all those links and everything else. Uh, Teresa says, happy Easter also. And like I said, for anybody in Hernando County, if you need to stop by and get pick up your own ruler to teach your lawn service, what four inches it is four inches is from here all the way up to here that is how high you need to cut that saint augustine grass this is not four inches this is eventually dead lawn neighborhood 
this is eaten up with fungal diseases and long-term dead lawn. This is, you may be able to keep it on life support for a while. This is healthy, happy, beautiful lawn territory. It's four inches. So enough said on that. And one more thank you to Teresa. And we will see everybody back here again next Thursday at 10 a.m. I'll be here. Hopefully you will be too. So until then, thanks, guys. See you all later.